nostalgia was less something that one felt as something that one had in the way one might have cholera, tuberculosis, or just a banal cold. It entailed seeing a doctor, preferably one who knew what he was talking about, such as these medical officers who wrote their medical dissertations um, on nostalgia, and who would examine the patient for a variety of um, symptoms and signs, both mental and physical, and I'm going to spare you um, the details, before deciding whether to try to take care of this patient with a talking cure, um, with some proper infusion, or some um, leeches um, applied um, typically to, to the anus. Um, the prognosis varied widely and could sometimes turn bleak in a matter of days, leading to severe emaciation, pulmonary edema, often and other fatal complications. A routine autopsy might then reveal all sorts of ulcerations in various organs, including in particular um, in the brain, all of which the doctors would typically associate to the original uh, nostalgia. In other words, in short, the early 1800s was a time when people not only had nostalgia, but also died of nostalgia. This is what it looked like to die of nostalgia in 1832. The young man's sorrowful expression and his emaciated skeletal chest, as well as the presence of the dog at his side, suggest that this is a form of, again, a form of melancholia um, that breeds consumption, TB. We are indeed in the days of pre-bacteriological medicine, when sad passions of the soul were deemed to be predisposing um, sort of causal agents um, to the development of thesis of the white man's plague. The image clearly identifies nostalgia as a soldier's disease, tied to physical uh, displacement. We see the traveling trunks above the patient's head, the casquette d'Afrique that he's wearing, which is the new cap introduced at the time for the French army in Algeria, so this situates the, 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 the airship in, during the colonization of Algeria in the 1830s, and the letter placed prominently at the center of the composition, um, in which the, the soldier's holding, which points to home, here symbolized by the metonymic figure of a faithful dog, the épagnol breton, no less, which is a significant detail, as I'll come back to. This nostalgia is odd to us, because it is synchronically constructed. It is a spatial disease, a mal du pays, homesickness, Heimweh, malattia del paese. But just like the German notion of Heimat, the B is not just a specific locale, a place. It is also a sense of place and belonging in a living community, a historical community, structured by those pegs of collective memory um, that um, Maurice Holbach talks about. The letter, therefore, also speaks to a more abstract, emotional form of disembedding of this young man, reinforced, I think, by the anonymous silhouettes in the background, the reifying number hanging above his head, and most of all, perhaps, the incongruous female maternal nurse, um, um, sort of the female presence of the maternal nurse, significantly the only one who shows empathy for him and who can actually touch him. And I'm, I'm, one of the things I'm trying to suggest in the book is that this is, of course, the moment when armies become um, ultra-male um, um, universes separated from civilian society um, and where it develop the, develops the, the, the cult of supervile masculinity, alpha male. And conversely, I would say, an emotional invest, over-investment in the figure of the mother, in the missing mother. What this particular soldier needs is this, a doctor's certificate, um, recognizing that he's suffering from the atteint de nostalgie, suffering from nostalgia, and requesting that he be sent home on medical leave for three months, which was standard practice, as I was amazed to discover, um, in the French army from the revolutionary era all the way to the eve of the First World War, at a time when leaves were um, abolished for all sorts of other conditions. I mean, you could lose an arm and a leg um, and, 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 and lots of teeth most often, but you would still have to fight. Whereas if you suffered from nostalgia, ah, okay. <laughs> um, provided the doctor show this convincingly and weed out the inevitable malingerers, which of course was a major, uh, a major concern. And, and I argue that the, the physicians use this as a tool in their professionalizing drive to try to gain credibility within, within the army. So there's, there's an argument here about professionalization built into, into the story. What might happen were this patient not to be sent home um, looks something like this. Another casualty down here, décédé par suite de nostalgie. Um, if not an epidemic um, of affection nostalgique that could spread contagiously 
and designate entire units, as in this case a battery, an artillery battery um, stationed in Rouen in, the 18, um, in 1839. And you will note the rural mountainous origins of these soldiers, suspiciously all coming from Brittany or from um, the Vosges or wherever else they're, they're coming from. Um, and they were believed to be primitive, not knowing French, could not adapt to the army, so would be more exposed than anybody else to the kind of isolation and disembedding that I was talking about um, before. The French were neither the first nor the only ones to suffer from this deadly homesickness. The term itself was coined in Basel in 1688 by a 19-year-old medical student from the nearby town of Mulhouse. Now today, 19-year-old medical students um, invent Facebook. Um, back in the day, they invented nostalgia. That's my nostalgia. Um, an unlikely medical maverick, um, Johannes Hoffer, who you see here later on in life, together with his um, dissert original dissertation that coins the new Um Johannes Hoffer um, decided to affix this savant and pleasing neologism built from the Greek roots Noskos, um, homecoming and Alvos, pain or longing, to strange stories of Swiss, young Swiss men and women um, who seem to succumb from ill-defined fevers when, and consumption when far away from home. Many of these were Swiss mercenaries, of course, stationed abroad in armies um, across um, Europe, who allegedly dropped dead at the mere sound of familiar tunes or cowbells sometimes. And this is a reference to the legendary effects of the Curai in Laurence de Vache, whom Kant and Rousseau and another um, write about extensively. Um, and there's a whole sort of literature that develops around this. And you see an example here of, again, the melancholy pose of the Swiss soldier whilst listening to this song. Offer viewed nostalgia as a passion of the soul, um, an emotional disorder akin to melancholia, we call Christemanium, but caused specifically by the burning desire to see one's homeland again, so again, this very spatial understanding. He provided an eclectic pathogenesis, which I'll explain the details of for the condition, and a wide ranging epidemiological grounding that I suggest had as much to do with the medical discoveries of his age um, as it did um, with. Mulhouse's precarious condition as a Protestant, independent Protestant enclave, sandwiched between much larger Catholic kingdoms, and especially um, uh, from Louis XIV's um, um, expansionist France, shall we say, and which was dependent upon regular provision of Swiss troops <coughs> for its defense um, throughout the wars of religion. Throughout much of the 18th century, nostalgia um, was thus billed a Schweizer kind, a Swiss disease. A century later, however, French doomsayers, and especially colonial doomsayers, had come to think of it as le mal le plus français. After the French. <laughs> um, although similar epidemics were actually reported um, elsewhere, um, in the Prussian army, the Russian army, the Piedmontese, the Egyptian, all the way to American Union conscripts, as well as in the Royal Navy and amongst um, um, uh, sailors and other people sent to penal colonies. Um, and here you have some examples of um, from the American Civil War, um, from the Napoleonic Wars, and um, in Tasmania, um, um, with um, convicts sent um, over there by the British. Nor was nostalgia exclusively a military problem, and I think this is important. It drove African slaves to commit suicide in the Caribbean and the South. Um, it was often, um, eventually, by the 19th century, described as a form of Negro consumption. Um, there was even an attempt to medicalize it with the, the diagnosis of trapezomania, um, which begins to point to the kind of racial reframing of the nostalgia diagnosis in the 19th century that I view as fundamental to understanding how nostalgia went from pathological to becoming what I would call homeopathic, to becoming a sort of benign form of, of belonging. Um, and I, we can come back to that um, um, later on. Ironically, it also decimated French um, colonial settlers um, in Algeria. Um, so, sort of what they would call, what they called, um, uh, what uh, Prosper Enfantin, I think, the, the, the utopian socialist called uh, the nostalgie africaine. One century before, and in a sort of mirror effect, one century before the, the, the neo-colonial and much romanticized nostalgie of the late 20th century. Many others, including prison inmates, um, domestic servants, even boarding school <coughs> students. Um, suffered from the condition, and in some cases wound up on coroner's reports, such as these ones um, that you see here. Some 70 French medical students wrote 
their dissertation, their MD dissertation, on nostalgia in the 19th century, which may not seem like very much, but it places nostalgia, according to that yardstick, it places it second as, it, as the, most, uh, so the most studied um, psychiatric disorder in the 19th century after um, hysteria. And here you can see a, a chart showing the blue is the, the, the number of dissertations on nostalgia, and so you can see they're lumped very much in, in the first half of the 19th century. Um, in red you have monomania, which was obviously less um, well studied by students. Monomania is crucial in the professionalization of the French psychiatric um, 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 profession. Um, and at the end of the century, at a time when there are about four to ten times as many students um, enrolling, so these are absolute numbers, it's not comparative, um, you, you have obviously the, the, the huge interest in, in neurasthenia right at the end of, of, of the century. Um, the figure of the nostalgic victim by this point um, has also become a staple of plays, popular songs, novels, perhaps most memorably in Balzac's nosographic panorama of French society, La Comédie Humaine. And again, this is not just a French phenomenon, it happens elsewhere too, although it is particularly acute in France. We can come back to in the Q&A perhaps as to why this is both a argument, this is both a general phenomenon, but also specifically a um, French phenomenon. Now, at this point, I realize that some of you may be getting a, a little bit anxious, a little bit worried at what might happen to you the next time you, your mind drifts back to see tainted memories of good old days and, 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 and childhood. Um, I'd like to reassure you, um, nobody has died of nostalgia, as far as I know, um, um, in over a century. Um, the, French, the French army um, records its last deadly case officially in 1884. Um, and four years later, readers of the New York Times, as I'm sure you all are, um, could um, take, you know, breathe a sigh of relief at reading an article about a remarkable case um, of this rarest of disease, um, and that it was next to impossible for, for the Americans to have it. Um, the, the British felt very similarly um, um, about um, their, their lack of propensity um, to nostalgia. Um, and by World War I, as you can see in the postcard um, here, um, it's possible to say that a moderate dose of um, um, homesickness was even encouraged um, amongst um, soldiers to help them maintain that sort of frail Ariadne spread, tying them back to home, concretized in the letters and the parcels that they would receive daily, um, and that sort of allowed them at least to hope that they would get out of the horror of the trenches on the Western Front. Today, psychologists assure us that this is an utterly benign and positive emotion, hardwired in the brain, almost as basic and as natural as love and fear themselves. So a possible, if perhaps somewhat uncharitable way of describing my book um, would be to say that I have devoted 300 pages to um, describing in depth that uh, what we already know um, and that is encapsulated in that most wonderfully tautological of cliches that nostalgia ain't what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> to justify, if I can, to justify the price tag um, and the patience of those who have stuck with me and endured um, 14 years of me um, working on this, uh, weekends included, and they know who they are, and I'm very grateful to them. Um, I would point to the fact um, that this book is the first book to actually try to tell um, this story of nostalgia based on archival material, the kind of material I can show you um, just now. And this is essential, I feel, um, to grasp this deadly nostalgia, not just as a literary phenomenon, not just as a cultural um, category, but as a concrete form of practice, an emotional disposition of wide social significance that mediated people's interactions with a rapidly changing modern world. And in this respect, I see the army as a laboratory for these kinds of transformations. Um, um, oft overlooked in that respect, um, David um, um, has corrected that in many respects, um, but, um, but still today it seems a sort of outlier, and, and, and we tend to forget that a lot of the transformations of society um, um, happened, are pioneered in the army. Doing this kind of, of history um, entails oscillating, moving back and forth between different levels of analysis. And so the book works both as a work of intellectual history, a conceptual history of a, of a trending um, um, term, a trending um, um, concept. I, I do a lot of medical history, um, looking at the different medical theories that um, first frame nostalgia, reframe nostalgia, eventually um, um, lead to the disappearance of nostalgia as a medical category once it's sort of invalidated um, from, from taxonomies. 
Um, but I also um, try to balance this with a much more ethnographic, uh, with a more ethnographic approach, a more granular approach, close to personal experiences and to social contextualization. Um, and um, I also move back and forth between um, large-scale canvases, um, sort of grand vistas covering two centuries and to a certain extent three continents, although it is very much um, based in France and its colonies. Um, and I balance that up with narrow close-ups where I pause, um, zoom in on individual case studies, whether it's the Napoleonic Wars or the colonization of Algeria, or individual trajectories um, 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 in, in those uh, episodes to explore what I would consider revealing effects of scale. Throughout, I work interdisciplinarily, um, borrowing from anthropology, from literary studies, from social theory, from psychology, convinced that history works best when it doesn't think of itself as some sort of Brexit discipline, um, but rather <laughs> as a meta-discipline, and I say that very humbly, um, um, as a temporal framework for just about everything and anything that one might be interested in, including emotions. Another way of saying this is that this is not necessarily a history of emotion of an emotion per se, although I will not deny that it having become a field, I have jumped onto the bandwagon a little bit. Um, rather, I, tend, I like to think of this as a history that does not leave the emotions out, um, which I think is something that we have tended um, to do up until um, recently. With this methodological scaffolding, I try to not only reveal empirically what nostalgia was, but also to understand how and why it came into being as an object of scientific interest, and perhaps even more importantly, why it didn't just disappear, phlogiston-like, when invalidated by a scientific revolution of sorts. After all, that's what happened to many other transient mental illnesses of the 19th century monomania, fugue syndrome, lipomania, the, the list goes on and on and on. So in a way, this, this is obviously what Ian Hacking calls a transient mental illness, but it's not that too. It is something else. There is something peculiar to the fact that nostalgia outlived its own conditions of possibility to become seemingly eternal, natural, folded into the everyday, normal, psychic makeup of our daily lives. Here the historian in me starts to get a little nervous because the suspicion arises that perhaps there are things that are not historically specific, the transistor, the travel across time, and perhaps we need psychologists, philosophers, Help us here. The Freudian in me starts to think of mother's wombs, um, and that is a slippery slope. I'm not going to go down right now. To explain this naturalization of nostalgia, I look on the one hand to a process of cultural diffusion, um, a sort of assimilation of nostalgia in a much broader context. Um, so, where it in the 19th century it clearly becomes a general cultural category, a sort of floating signifier, if I may borrow that term from Didier Fassin's um, um, uh, and Robert Ackman's um, analysis of, of, of trauma in, in contemporary um, society. Um, but, this, um, but this is something that I, I suggest happens over a very long long durée. It happens over the course of the entire 19th century. Um, and you can see that with a very sort of rudimentary um, chart of uh, Google engrams that shows how usage of the word nostalgia in a much broader context, not just medical, um, only really picks up at the turn of the 20th century. So not so much um, an invention of the Romantic age, but perhaps more of the fin de siècle and indeed of what we would call a belle époque, which is perhaps fitting um, 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 coincidence um, there. Um, this suggests to me that um, cultural analyses that try to explain um, sort of rupture, um, the big the work on sort of nostalgia based on the notion of, of, temporal, of linear temporality and rupture are perhaps not fully adequate to understand um, what is going on. And so instead I try to embed um, this analysis of nostalgia in a, what I would see as a much more, a much more peculiar, much more contradictory um, form of temporality that is specific, I think, to, to um, um, the capitalist epoch. One that is not just the sort of linear, runaway notion of progress, um, acceleration that we often think of, but that balances that with a much more cyclical, looping um, effect that constantly sort of dredges on the past and recapitulates it as a new, as a new um, future. I try to explore this empirically, not just um, theoretically, in fact, the theoretical part actually got axed um, in the book. Um, but I trace this both at the level of the individual psyche, in the way in which Napoleonic <coughs> veterans were the first, I argue, the first modern nostalgics, the first to start 
longing for a previous period of their life, which happened to be their life in the army, where eventually they did build those kind of forms of social identity that had initially gone lacking when they joined the army. And so the paradox there is that they, they get to long um, in a sort of bittersweet way for an institution that initially provoked them to feel the more pathological um, 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 form of nostalgia. I also explored this at a more objectified level, a more sort of concrete um, level, in the construction of lookalike um, replica French villages, and I've always thought of this as sort of Legoland um, in, in, in Algeria, um, which is of course not a new phenomenon per se. I mean, we're well placed here um, to know that um, the, 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 the colonies of New England um, um, reproduced that kind of persistent localism here too. But all of a sudden, what's happening here is that it's done in a medicalized um, way. Um, and that, out of nowhere, those people who previously had been suffering the most from nostalgia, Le Breton, for example, all of a sudden become ideal candidates for immigration. And so you start having um, um, companies specializing in the recruitment of rural people, such as Le Breton, to go and colonize Algeria. And what is most fascinating to me about, um, about this is that these are often joint stock, um, completely unregulated and often very um, fraudulent um, um, companies um, floated on the Paris um, Stock Exchange. And so basically what you have is this sort of um, finance capital, this ultimate emblem of modern abstraction, engaging in the business of reproducing archaic, and this, that's the way they describe what they're doing, archaic forms of lost life worlds that they themselves had contributed to abolishing in the first place. And so you have this kind of um, dialectic um, um, going on here, which for me is a dialectic that you see very much in the cycles of the fashion industry and the sort of recurring crises of capitalism. And so what I try to do at the end of the book is suggest that um, maybe um, nostalgia is um, a quintessentially modern phenomenon that obviously taps into transhistorical things. Um, but that it, what's specific about it is that it is, it is a subjective experience of time and space both made possible by and adequate to the peculiar regimes of temporality of capitalism, a form of practice that gradually congeals into a structural determinant. So these are, these are individual practices done by individuals, but they gradually become forces operating behind their back, so to say, in an anonymous way. An emotional habitus, if you will, one that I find to be fundamentally constitutive of modernity and not some form of underdetermined antithesis. To Thank you. Okay. Um, well, many, many thanks to, to Tom and the Maison Francaise and Manuel for inviting me here today. I'm really delighted to be able to play a small part in launching this terrific book. Um, what I think about the book shouldn't really come as a surprise to anybody because you can actually look at the back cover and see my assessment. Um, remarkably, I chose David carefully. Remarkably creative and original. This book has significant implication for how we understand the history of the emotions, the history of psychiatry, and the history of modern European society. Close quote. I guess I liked it. Um, actually, I more than liked it. It is really a remarkable book. Um, Tom has taken a phenomenon that could easily be interpreted, written off, as just a kind of historical oddity, an example of a kind of uninformed medical error, and he's found a far more interesting, complex, and surprising story to tell about it. As he acknowledges in the book, he's not the first historian to, 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 to look at the strange history of nostalgia, I think especially Marcel Reinhardt's wonderful article from 1958, but, but Tom really tells it in a far deeper more convincing manner than anybody has done before, and really shows its significance, how you can use it as a means of saying something really significant about all of modern history. Um, but I don't want to spend my time here simply elaborating on this praise, although I could. <laughs> and I don't want to spend it struggling to find half-hearted objections and nitpicking criticisms for the sake of sparking a discussion, although I could. Um, I'd like to offer some thoughts about the kind of book this is and the way it helps us understand modern European society, modern Western society, and then to finish with a couple of questions. So, um, to, 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 to think about the kind of book this is, let me offer a few quotes from the book. So, page two. Um, this clinical form of nostalgia was symptomatic of an incipient medicalization of society. 
page 74, the nostalgia epidemic of the revolutionary and Napoleonic wars must be viewed as symptomatic of, de of deeper social transformations foreshadowed in the army. Page 140, the turn to l'amour du pays in post-Napoleonic France must be understood as symptomatic of a society unmoored and in search of stability. And finally, page 189, at the conclusion, nostalgia's tortuous path ought to be seen as symptomatic of transnational trends common to many parts of an increasingly global world. So I think you see the pattern. In fact, very much like the eager late 17th century medical student Johannes Hofer, with whom, of whom you've heard, the learned Dr. Godman has written a book also that started as a dissertatio, like Hofer's did, um, that is in a sense an exercise in diagnosis. And where Dr. Hofer was diagnosing physical bodies, Dr. Dodman has diagnosed a body social. He's careful not to treat, as you've just heard, the discourses and concepts that he's looking at as pathologies. But they still are for him very much, as these quotes show they are symptoms. And in his concise, thought-provoking afterward, he presents them as symptoms that help him to that help us to understand again what he just called himself the modern capitalist epoch and the complex and sometimes contradictory ways that this epoch has shaped perceptions of time, emotional states, and forms of subjectivity. Now, Tom's use of the word symptom is not accidental. And it's not careless. I mean, it's, this is not simply a case of medical language rubbing off on the historian of disease. A symptom is a manifestation of a deeper underlying cause. And I think the use of the word therefore says something important about the kind of book that Tom's written. He, he could have chosen to write his classic internalist medical history and explain the strange career of nostalgia by reference to the overall, simply to the overall evolution of medical theory and practice from the 17th through the 19th centuries. He could have chosen to write a kind of new historicist uh, cultural analysis, taking a series of moments in time, and then for each one placing texts about nostalgia and dialogue with other texts from a variety of other fields, medical and non-medical, tracing out connections and common patterns. Um, in neither of these cases would nostalgia and its treatment really be symptoms, symptomatic. They would be maybe stages of scientific progress in one case, they, might, they would be discourses, texts in the other case. But instead, and we, I think we can very much trace some influences here from the University of Chicago to Gabriel Sewell, Jan Goldstein, and Moshe Paston. I mean, Tom is trying to show how the history of nostalgia helps us to diagnose and understand broad changes that are ultimately changes in the structures of material life. Changes connected, as just said, to the capitalist epoch. And capitalism, I should, I should add very quickly, defined not simply as an economic system, but in Bill Sewell's terms, as a complex social whole that has its own specific political, social, social, cultural, and, as Tom shows, emotional features. Now, in particular, as we've just heard, he's devoted particular attention to two successive and distinct symptoms. So first, there is the identification of nostalgia as a physical illness, something that begins in the late 17th century with Dr. Hofer, and then it's followed by the epidemic of nostalgia that is manifested with particular force in the French military from the revolutionary period through much of the 19th century. So that's the first symptom. And then there's a rather different symptom, starting in the mid-19th century, by which nostalgia becomes redefined as a benign and even useful emotion. So in the first case, the symptom is being here diagnosed as a reaction to the vastly heightened mobility, the wrenching of people away from familiar settings and rhythms of life that begin to take place in such a particularly intensive manner during the French Revolutionary Wars, both for volunteers like Gantier and Noël, who's a particularly important character here, and also for conscripts. Uh, Tom writes in a particularly nice phrase that what these men experienced was, and I'm quoting, an estrangement from themselves from the time and place of their former lives. And furthermore, the institution in which they served, namely the army of the French Republic and Empire, uh, judged their longing for these former lives to be, in a sense, deleterious to their ability to function effectively in their new roles as soldiers. And he largely limits his investigation here to the French military. But when I read this, his afterward, particularly, it's hard not to think that he's also offering implicitly a diagnosis that could uh, apply rather more broadly, for instance, to the wrenching of newly made workers out of the times and places of their former lives and their own painful adjustment to the time discipline and rhythms of commercial and then industrial capitalism. And one question I actually have for Tom is how far he'd be willing to push this possible connection. 
Is there an epidemic of nostalgia on the factory floor? If so, why did it receive more attention? I suppose one, one answer might be that the industrial labor force was not as closely monitored by medical professionals as the French army, and that the medical professionals who did pay attention to it certainly didn't have the same sort of incentives that the French professionals you're talking about did to establish their professional expertise through the diagnosis of things like nostalgia. But I'd like to hear you talk a little more about the various ways that capitalism affects life rhythms and why the effect seems to have been so pronounced in this particular institution. Now, the second part of the book, Diagnosis, a different sort of symptomatic reaction, which is centered on, as you just heard, on the experience of, of white settlers in the expanding overseas French empire, especially in North Africa. These settlers, too, could feel a powerful longing for their former lives. But in this case, the institutions that monitored and governed them came to very different conclusions about this longing, about this emotion. In this case, the emotion these men and women felt was judged, in fact, to be benign and actually useful for nourishing a sense of connection between the settlers and the home country. And so even as medical cases of potentially fatal nostalgia were dropping away and finally disappeared, references to nostalgia as a mild, benign emotion proliferated. Now again, Tom puts a particular focus here on the French colonies, but perhaps a little less clearly than in the first case, he seems to be implicitly offering a diagnosis that also applies more broadly, in this case to what Actually, I, I might say it would be the sphere of consumption, particularly under modern, in the modern capitalist epoch. Isn't it true that if capitalist work discipline requires one sort of relationship to time, namely sort of regular, abstract, sharply measured, capitalist consumption <coughs> encourages another, less well-defined and regulated, lumpier, to use a word that Tom applies at one point, certainly more oriented towards a kind of imaginary, imagined past. You only have to look at the advertising that surrounds us to see, and where did my last page go in here? Uh, here we go. Uh, to see the degree to which capitalist practices of consumption involve the stimulation of longing for a simpler, more natural, more organic society, which is to say, in large part, the stimulation of different kinds of nostalgia. Um, as I mentioned, in coming to these conclusions, Tom refers above all to the work of some of his teachers, uh, such as uh, Boston and, and Sewell. At the risk of doing a little cheerleading for a close relative, I'd like to add that it also fits in very well with what has been called the cultural contradictions of capitalism, <laughs> um, written by my father, Daniel Bell. Um, now, if I have any criticism at all of the book, I guess I do have to propose at least one, it's that the afterword in which Tom raises all these fascinating and provocative issues, most directly, is so short and so compressed. Maybe we can blame this on the publisher. Um, but I certainly would have loved to have seen him dilate upon the implications of the story for the epoch of modern capitalism at somewhat greater length, and I hope you do continue to, to do so. Um, but to conclude, I'd like to just pose a couple of questions, a couple more questions. So first, in, in the last paragraph of the book, you say that it behooves the historical profession to pay more attention to emotional life. And could you actually offer some, some thoughts on how historians, and especially historians of France, might do this while drawing upon the example of your book? What, what other sort of emotional conditions or perceived emotional dysfunctionalities might serve as revealing symptoms in the way you have proposed for nostalgia. Certainly one of the clearest examples I can think of here is hysteria, which has certainly been investigated a great deal, especially as a symptom of changes in gender relations. I know that you're moving on to a very different sort of project focused on a single individual who you discovered in the course of writing this book, Gabriel Noel. But if you were to think of something that would be more of a sequel to this book, what subject might you pick and what might you do differently this time around? And finally, secondly, and I just had a question which actually just occurred to me as I was hearing you, in part I think because you, because you delivered your talk so beautifully um, in a, such a sort of literary vein. And it, and it occurred to me actually that when I think of the subject of longing for home, the line that leaps to mind is the following, if I forget the Jerusalem, let my hand forget its cunning. I mean, homesickness is an emotion which in the Western tradition has been powerfully shaped by religion, by the experience of exile, which was so important a part of the Jewish tradition, but which has entered into, therefore, the Christian tradition as well, especially through the Psalms. Um, and when we study the history of emotions in deeply religious societies, how do we integrate religious experience into this story? Um, and I'm sure I've already gone over my time, so I will stop there and just end with that question. So thank you very much again for trying to so much.
um, in the time period and the kind of issue that are being raised by uh, Thomas. Um, but sometimes it's good to have this slightly um, outsider's uh, perspective. Can you hear me? Um, so, um, to sum up, <laughs> it's all in the title, What Nostalgia Was. Uh, this is a history book, so a great, fantastic history book in that it makes us understand and thanks to its incredible literary quality it makes us feel um, the strangeness of the recent past, the moment when people could literally die of nostalgia. Those people being mostly um, young French white males, mostly soldiers, uh, in the first half of the 19th century, but later on, toward the end of the century, and maybe as late as World War I, uh, these people are also uh, colonial crews. So, on, on this topic, the, the book accomplishes an incredible feat in that it completely escapes a presentist standpoint. We, we not, the analysis of Taja is never uh, done through the screen of our uh, contemporary understanding of Spelja, and it presents, manages to present, I quote uh, the book on page 192. Um, clinical nostalgia through contemporary eyes and the conceptual world often quite um, foreign to our own. Yet, this is not uh, in the book, Thomas Dunman does not develop an antiquarian interest for something entirely past. But it seems that the, the, the reason why we have to care about nostalgia is that nostalgia is still with us, albeit in a completely different form. The process that he describes is the process of transformation from a deadly disease of the mind and of the body to a benign and often productive um, emotion, which is what he said uh, in his presentation. One of the themes of the book is that this, tr this transformation, which was nonlinear, uh, the man insists on the continuities and discontinuities, on contingencies and structural transformation of state power and capitalism in the 19th century, this transformation has shaped our modernity, and maybe I want to uh, uh, transform my, uh, change my formulation here, is symptomatic to uh, uh, Bell's uh, uh, very apt uh, description of what the book does, is symptomatic of our modernity. And while this is first and foremost a French story, uh, it goes much beyond, the book, the, the book goes much beyond the uh, hexagon and um, Toward the end, mostly, uh, Dunman evokes uh, a global dimension, or at least a Western hemisphere uh, space for the history of nostalgia. He mentioned earlier the slaves, uh, and, and very quickly, and maybe too quickly to be completely convincing, the, uh, the slaves in the French Caribbean, the, so the American soldiers in the Civil War, but also Sudan, uh, uh, <coughs> as places where nostalgia uh, occurred. Um, so before discussing this, uh, demonstration, this, this, which is about this process of transformation, I'd like to uh, point three things. Uh, first of all, I think that the, ma the main contribution of the book is really a reflection on the conditions of possibility for nostalgia. So one of them in the book is very clearly displacement. Uh, Disembeddingness? Uh, yeah, disembedding. Uh, and that's one of them. So migration, movement, uh, exile. Uh, one other uh, very central condition of possibility for nostalgia is war. Or at least something that looks like war, that is to say a very strong uh, form of coercion. Um, uh, because he mentioned the group also of settlers in Algeria who are kind of living in a, in a very you know, military kind of society, but still. Um, so migrants per se, the fact of migrating in itself is not Produce, pro, does not produce nostalgia. And this, I think, would be very interesting to look at, um, to compare this and the, the, the kind of nosography of nostalgia that you, um, that you described so well in the book to more contemporary um, uh, medical discourse, like ethnopsychiatry in France about migrants and the whole, uh, you know, uh, feeling of nostalgia and exile and, 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 and alienation, which is a word that doesn't appear in the book, but um, that uh, migrants uh, feel, but that's that's a mistake. Um, so one of the one of the characteristic of this condition of, of war as being a condition of possibility is that it's a low level war. It's a it's a war that uh, that 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 nostalgia occurs when actually soldiers are not fighting, when they're bored, when they are waiting in between two battles, when they don't know when the next. Uh, um, the next battle is going to happen, and that applies to the Napoleonic War. So I 
and no nothing, I mean, and no whatever, no surveillance, <laughs> which is a lot, but uh, it, the, the, I, I don't know much more than that, so I, I, I find it interesting. In the case of Algeria, um, even the fact that you know about a third of the Algerian population is wiped off the map in the years that you speak about, speaking about a low level war is kind of uh, counterintuitive and interesting to know a little more about that. Um, and and uh, the other thing that uh, is a condition of possibility is really the, 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 the feeling, the frustration with coercion, the reaction to coercion or to disciplinary regimes that we evoke. And so that's what the settlers feel. They're nostalgic also because they feel that they are being almost, they live almost in a military kind of society. And uh, going back to what Professor Bell was saying, I think it's a very interesting um, um, kind of absence in the work. Um, uh, the, 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 what is interesting as an absence is the, 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 the fact that you never speak about rural migrants in France, the industrial workers who are also migrants. So one of the things I was thinking when I was reading this, maybe one of the, would be actually um, uh, strengthening your case, because this case would be strengthening your demonstration in the sense that those rural migrants actually were able to go back home, mm -hmm. that the French migration were always seasonal, they were short term, mm -hmm. and there was a, a very great amount of resistance from the French work, to, from the part of the French workers to this coercion of industrialization, maybe that would be interesting to say. Uh, so, but but really the, the like really underlying uh, the conditions of positive nostalgia are one of the very interesting constraints of the book. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to say that is uh, maybe more important is the very um, the extremely uh, ambitious character of the book. It is still mass behind something like maybe British. Um, rhetorical um, understatement for uh, kind of elegance, rhetorical elegance, so it's not very, you know, you don't uh, uh, wear your big uh, stereo on your sleeves, <laughs> you're, you're very um, discreet, and, and that's, you know, I, I find this amazing, but I should say that, you know, the book is really, tries to provide a history of the unconscious and the history of, 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 of trauma or the prehistory of that. You, you said that much very discreetly at the bottom of page 120. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's, 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 that's what you know, that's interesting. Okay. Another thing that I read to underline is really um, the, the, the breadth of historical uh, inquiry from 17th century Swiss medicine to, uh, uh, and, and popular music. Swiss popular music to rippling letters addressed by um, Napoleon's soldiers to their mom and to the life in those Alsatian uh, settler villages in Algeria. So it's uh, incredibly rich in terms of the archives, in terms of the documentation, and again, the literary quality of your writing makes it very lovely. This said, I have two questions, two, uh, I mean, yeah, one, I mean, really two questions that kind of I would like to push you a little on the demonstration. One is about the second part of the title, the undertitle, War Empire and the Time of a Daily Emotion. So you are really uh, making uh, a history, or you, you really want to make a history of an emotion. But it seems to me that um, this emotion is never felt. It is an emotion that is described. That is an emotion that is, or at least that, that's actually it's not an emotion that describes, it's a disease that is described and spoken about. Um, um, it seems to me that you are more interested uh, in the disease that precedes the emotion, that the emotion itself, uh, you speak mostly, I and mean, in the center of your of gravity of your demonstration is really the medical discourse, and especially uh, the military medical discourse about nostalgia in the first half of the 19th century. And the people who are supposed to feel this nostalgia, the soldiers and later the settlers, never use the word, right? They speak about ennui, chagrin, Melancholy, mal du pays, cafard in World War One. But I was trying to, to read the, the text extremely um, uh, uh, with a lot of attention, and I never say, I never see those people suffering from nostalgia speaking about it. And yet, it seems to me that uh, we are being told in the book that there is something very important in the uh, in the process of invention of a nosography of a specific disease that is not reducible to either chagrin or ennui or uh, cafard or even all these things taken together. So here there is a tension that I think I'd like to, know, I mean, I'd like to uh, discuss, I'd like to discuss a little, because I'd like to know what it tells us about both medical discourse and also about the history of that emotion itself. One of the 
possible explanation is that it's an elite discourse about popular classes, right? Most of those uh, soldiers and soldiers are from the popular classes. You uh, you mentioned the thesis of the 1803 by Dr. Gerbois, uh, Essay sur la nostalgie appelée vulgairement maladie du pays. So, vulgairement, that's to say, commonly called uh, maladie du pays. So, here there is not a, the, the elitism is not a kind of social elitism, it's more like an elitism of, an elitism of knowledge. But I don't think that's enough. Um, you actually don't quote that many literary sources, seeing that uh, even Chateaubriand is not interested in nostalgia. There is one occurrence of nostalgia in the entire Mémoire du Troton, which is about 4,000, 5,000 pages, and Chateaubriand being the symbol of his in French kind of, uh, of nostalgia. And uh, I, I, I mostly, uh, we see Balzac and Eugène Scrit <coughs> as amateurs of nostalgia in 19th century in 19 uh, literature. So it seems to me that the crux of the demonstration bears on the medical discourse more so than on the you know, general cultural uh, formation. So that's, uh, and, and, and mostly it's doing a, a, it's a discourse about a disease that is not felt by the people who are supposed to, uh, to, to be vigilant. The second question is about the, um, the demonstration itself, the process. How to understand this transformation from a DV disease to a benign and uh, productive, um, pro productive uh, emotion, as you, as you say. You spoke in your presentation here about a process of cultural diffusion. And it is true that, um, uh, I, I would uh, follow on uh, Dr. Bell's remarks, that the demonstration here gets a little less clear. Um, <coughs> you document very well, it seems to me, the, both the emergence and the, the appearance of nostalgia as uh, a medical category, uh, but the transformation into an emotion is a little less clear. You seem to, and that's something I, I'd like you to maybe elaborate a little on, you seem to find that the uh, uh, colonization of Algeria is essential to this process of transformation from a disease into an emotion. Um, and uh, you mentioned this in, in, your, um, in your presentation, it's also towards the end of the book around page 186, there is the idea that the settlement of uh, French um, of French settlers in Algeria, French colonizers in Algeria, was both a moment in which, if, if I understood well, in which the um, the um, reproduction of Frenchness in Algeria necessitated a attachment, a form of attachment to the to, the, to France and to mostly to the little pays. <laughs> And let's say the uh, you know the, the settlement of four villages uh, of Alsatians or whatever, uh, and so both an attachment to a little country, to a to a, to, to a specific place in France, and a process of globalization, right? That what you call uh, the process of you know, the expansion of capitalism, and this is where the the, 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 the Technical change, transformation of transportation, and so capital, uh, flux of capital to matter into this moment of globalization. But how does that really, how does that uh, explain the naturalization of nostalgia? How does that explain the fact that nostalgia does become a benign emotion that was a little less clear for me? So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Have a little more on this. Thank you. I don't think I can um, want to address what you 
for, 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 for Q&A. Um, the, the question of the, 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 the why the worker is not in here is one of my biggest regrets because that's where the project actually started. And it started with um, the French hygienist Guillermé commenting, and he's in the book, and commenting on the fact that the, 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 the alienated workers um, that he's visiting in the factories, the cotton factories in, in, uh, in Mulhouse, accidentally, and, and, and around there, um, remind him of the nostalgic soldiers that he was treating 20 years earlier on the boundaries of the continent of France. And that, for me, was, okay, there is a story of what we used to call proletarianization here with emotions added into it, um, which is one of the things that I think attention to emotions um, brings back in. It sort of enables us to readdress some old questions that have sort of been left aside and that I think um, um, we should be we should be thinking a little bit more about. Um, but this, the sad fact is that because there was no labor medicine and because um, workers are expendable, much more expendable than soldiers, um, and there was no incentive um, to, to, to medicalize um, whatever they were suffering from. And so the sources are simply not there beyond the couple of references that I found. Um, what became interesting for me, so, so I, I was faced with a sort of a, a, a problematic um, empirical lack that, that, that I, I, originally the work is was going to be a, a third case study together with the employment course and colonization, and eventually I decided um, um, partly on the advice of my editor <laughs> that, that, that um, it probably was not worth spending an extra um, 34 years on that. Um, what, um, what that does, um, What that does raise, um, though, is the, yeah, what I, the way in which I did try to address it, which is one way of um, making uh, sort of a, a, an apology um, for the fact that the slaves are not as much in this book as much as they should be. Um, um, again, the, 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 the limitations on, on what I felt I could do um, and what had to be published. But what I did end up coming to think of was of the army as a sort of halfway laboratory between slavery and factory in, 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 in a sort of gradation of forms of increasingly abstract domination um, that for me, um, and I'm taking this from the um, um, is the way in which um, domination heteronomy evolves over the course of the early phase of modernity. And, so, um, and what's interesting about the, the, the soldiers is that they are, they are what I would say Marx calls doubly free living. They are free because they're citizen soldiers and they have rights, um, but they're only free to, to sell their labor um, as workers, and, the, and, the, and the, they are um, subjected to a form of domination, a very, very concrete form of domination in the army. So that's where this, that's why the soldiers are particularly interesting for me um, because they have this sort of schizophrenic, shall we say, for lack of prehistory of trauma. Um, 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 situation um, that they are in. And so one of the things I try to do is just suggest that the soldiers, um, and this goes back to the question of the rural, the rural migrants uh, who don't suffer from nostalgia, and the sources you know, typically um, re-emphasize this in, in the Garni in Paris, in the, in the, in the, the, the seasonal laborers, um, because they go back to home, because they don't lose this connection um, to home, um, and that's made most explicit in, in um, the, the artists of the Compagnon. Um, who you know, leave home for several years on their tour de France to, for, for their training. Um, but what's remarkable is that they, they call their fellow artisans Mubi, even though they might come from somewhere else in France, this is simply a transport. Um, um, and the, the places where they stay, uh, where they're lodged on their tour of France, um, the, 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 the inn is called La Mer, um, and the innkeepers are called Ma Mère et Mon Père. Um, so there is a sort of reproduction family embedding um, that I would argue sort of inoculates to a certain extent to the forms of, of, of abstraction and disembedding that, that the soldiers um, um, and what's interesting is that in the army they try to reproduce that and so the, the phenomenon of band of brothers um, mm -hmm. appears already in the Napoleonic armies even though it's an army that ostensibly is supposed to create the nation by mixing people together um, it, uh, in fact on the ground, what you see is that when you look at the, the, the registre matricule, and I did a lot of quantitative analysis of the sort of the registre matricule of the army, what you realize is that they're actually lumping people together in groups of 10, 12 from the same team. So there's a sort of 
um, secret acceptance that the, the band of brothers, the band of being, should continue in spite of the official rhetoric of creating a, a, a national army. Um, what else can I um, um, talk a little bit about? Um, uh, I don't think, so the afterword is short, it's a compound. <laughs> don't, don't, read, don't read it. Um, I'll, I'll freely admit it's partly because I had to cut sh short the book. Um, I had no choice. Um, it's partly because I think that it was just incapable of, 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 of working it through. Um, I'm, I'm not a theorist, and, and I, I, at some point I realized that what I wanted to do was something that weaves the theory into an empirical um, 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 account to my model in that respect, if I may be so. Um, um, and the the Frankfurt School. Um, and so um, I believe in empirical um, work that is in conversation with the theory of sophisticated theoretical apparatus. But I, 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 I don't think I could, um, um, I didn't want to, and I don't think I could write um, um, a, a, a more expansive theoretical um, appendix, which is not to say that one shouldn't. Um, I think, I, think um, um, I, I definitely um, should have, um, but for, very, for these various reasons, I, I, I ended up um, not. Um, um, one of the things, maybe the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, quickly um, now. Um, um, so, yeah, there is a problem with the demonstration um, in the second part of the book, which you both um, 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 identified um, very lucidly. Um, there, I think, the symptomatic reading um, pushes as far as I can uh, um, try to push it, perhaps beyond the breaking point. Um, I'm trying to connect things that are not um, necessarily obviously connected. Um, and I'm, there I'm making a sort of um, a leap of not faith, but a, but a sort of a, 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 an argument that, um, that there is a connection there that is working at multiple abstract levels of radiation um, that are not necessarily visible, although I think with these joint stock companies you do see some sort of um, the, the, the connection to the, the developments of capital. Trying to um, um, track down. Um, I think at one point I I, um, I just felt that um, well no I don't, I don't I don't I don't I don't I still don't have a really good answer. I'll I'll be honest about it. Um, next book right now. <laughs> book twenty two. Um, the. The soldiers never never speak about nostalgia, and that's an important point. What I wanted to what I wanted to show what, was that there is um, what in medical history we call the doctor's discourse, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the codified um, Foucauldian discourse, shall we say, of of, of, um, of what nostalgia is, which they are deploying for instrumental reasons to um, And then there are the illness narratives, the, the patients' um, story, the soldiers' tale, which I. Didn't, wasn't able to do as much of as I, as I would have um, liked, although I, I think I do um, 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 uh, a, fair, a fair amount. Um, and what's interesting to me is that they show different stories. They don't necessarily show the same story, and in particular on the fact that the soldiers never really speak, they never own the term um, nostalgia. The term really doesn't become colloquial until we get into the 19th and 20th century. And that to me is just there's something um, about it, something perhaps symptomatic. Um, there are codes of masculinity being developed here that um, um, preclude the, the use of this of this term for for a lot of people. A lot of soldiers simply don't want to admit to the illness that they want to share with their their, 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 their their relatives and, and their families. But it seems to me that, and this is the last thing perhaps I'll say that um, in the slight disjunctures that you see um, appearing in these different levels of, 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 of discourse. That's one of the places where I think there is um, value in to paying attention, more attention to emotions. To, to, um, because what I've become convinced of, and um, it, it may just be me, um, but what I've become convinced of is that um, we operate with uh, far too um, monolithic, um, coherent understanding of human beings. And that, we are not. We are contradictory, thought, um, um, in all sorts of ways. Um, and it's difficult to, to, to try to get at that. Um, I, 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 I very much recognize that the, the, the new project that, that um, David alluded to, um, in part, is an attempt 
to try to, at a micro level, at an individual scale, with a very rich corpus of, 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 of letters, um, try to understand what I would call the overdetermination of the mind of, 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 um, of this particular soldier's mind, who's messed up for all sorts of reasons. That's why he's interesting. Um, but but I, I get the sense that, that um, people um, are like that, and, 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 and more in general, and that, and that we need to find ways to pay attention to that. And emotions, as for example, Ruth Harris has shown, or as, um, as um, Lindell Roper shows um, very well, um, ego documents and paying attention to emotions just shows a much much richer complexity <coughs> to their historical characters that we then can take into account in um, our explanations of why they decided to do this or that or why they decided to do this and that at one and the same time and it seems contradictory but it actually made sense in their mind when they were, they were thinking um, um, about things. Um, yeah, I, I should, I should um, stop there. I'm glad you pointed to the, 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 the sort of pain, the, the non-presentism. I, I, I at one point wanted to write this. I found Freud a hundred years before Freud. Um, and um, thankfully, I my was in the general team. And she said, no, you haven't. I <laughs> think about it a bit more. And, and obviously, she was right. And, um, and what I came to the conclusion was that there is a, a, a pre-trauma, trauma, psychic trauma, that is, is a sort of late 19th century, last of the 19th century invention. There is no notion of, tra of psychic trauma before. And what these, most of my physicians are working with is an understanding of how emotions impact our psychic life that in many ways, I find, is, <coughs> is much more developed than what we have come to um, um, expect and, and, and work with post-trauma. So, so trauma has sort of taken over in many ways. And you see this, there is a sort of continuity between nostalgia, shell shock, PTSD, but there is also an epistemic shift that, that, that radically um, makes, that makes these things radically um, incommensurate. Um, and I try to show that in the way that the, these physicians are describing um, um, what, what, what the symptoms are. It looks logical, but it's really not. Um, and, 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 and I think that's um, what's interesting about that very last thing is that um, a lot of discussions um, in military medical circles now are actually saying, um, there was a recent report in the late 90s in the American um, um, general surgeon saying, we actually need to rediscover this whole literature on nostalgia um, because um, our, our focus on PTSD is, is limiting. And, and if you look at the evolutions of, of the DSM, um, you can sort of see how, how that might be going. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but thank you for so much. Thank you. Uh, so, we have now time for questions. Uh, all of the hands are holding. Can you speak up? We have a question. I have a question. Maybe you can already spoke about it, but you missed it. Do you have a, a tranche of age where you would pinpoint where the phenomenon of nostalgia arises? I, I will make this observation. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, uh, what we call war songs, mountain songs of the uh, soldiers that fought for World War I in, in the Alps in Italy. And invariably, invariably, this song songs um, mention, I'm not even sure that they mention a girlfriend or a lover, but they mention the hope for it. And, and they, I mean, invariably there is this girl, this dreamt of girl, which might not exist, but, uh, so it, it seems to me that nostalgia arises from not a period of happiness exactly, but a period of, well, youthful hope. And that remains. I mean, it, it seems, to me, it seems like it qualifies very strongly of all phenomena of yourself. Yeah, but very, I'll, I'll answer that very briefly with um, um, a reference in Immanuel Kant's um, Anthropology, um, where he, he hears about these stories of these soldiers um, and, 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 and he sort of says, well, wait a minute, these soldiers are not really suffering from anything. Um, um, what they want, he's the first one of the first people to say, what they want is not to return home, what they want is to return to their childhood. 
um, and therefore, um, in the sort of the gesture of of, of Cleo, he sort of he also sort of. Yeah. Further than childhood, I mean, a period when love, love is born and, sure. and has not developed yet, and this is this, this is what you, yeah. you pine for. It doesn't yeah. exist, but you pine for just missing things. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, I'm working on uh, nostalgia and financialization, so. Um, Especially the end of your presentation really interested me. And um, I would be interested, even if you had to cut it out from the book uh, a little bit, um, your thoughts that you have on the theory, especially in the shift of the term of <coughs> the nostalgia from a spatial concept to a temporal concept, and whether you see maybe uh, a correspondence to Kusselik's subtle side. Um, or where, where you um, find that um, perhaps also reflected in the sources? I'll, I'll answer very briefly. I, 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 I argue that um, there is this, the, one of the conditions of possibility for nostalgia is the satellite site and the, the growing um, disjunction between the rise of expectation and space of experience. It sort of opens up the gap for something like nostalgia to be possible. But what Koselik doesn't see, I, I think, at least in the Koselik that I've read, um, and that what, therefore, somebody like Peter Fritcher, who's written about this, um, doesn't necessarily see at the level of, of cultural analysis, is that that's one side of the story, um, and that the temporalities of modernity have um, another, this other sort of moving effect, which is what, for me, ex can explain the naturalization of the of nostalgia, why it can become something that seems so seamless and so obvious that it is hardwired in, in, in our brain. And because you mentioned financialization, I'll, I'll simply mention this. There was a few years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, across airports in the world, there was HSBC had this wonderful ad campaign, which called HSBC, the world's local bank, right, which is an, an oxymoron, um, but one that I remember thinking of uh, very much in terms of what I was trying to work out here, that there is this idea that you can have it both ways. You can be the global bank, the financial institution, but it also reproduces the locality of those things there. Um, and I would argue that that is the fundamental blueprint to this our nostalgia, um, and that what I try to show is that it came into being historically, that it, that it, that it, that it wasn't always there, and that it might not always be there, but that it, it came into being at a precise moment in time, not precise for a certain duration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I know this was not the period you focused on, but I was wondering if there were in there any instances of nostalgia documented among the colonial soldiers who fought in the French um, army during the First and Second World Wars, or whether the French were concerned about this, or whether it was not any more concern at that point. I mentioned it very briefly in, at the end of the book. Um, that during the First World War, um, essentially no uh, white French soldier would be diagnosed with nostalgia. Those that would still be um, were colonial troops, um, um, mostly um, um, Senegalese. And, um, and it was very clearly um, and, um, and framed in a, in a, in a racial and racist um, way that this is a sign of the, the, the underdevelopment of, of, of these people, so they would call them. They, these are actually the people who then um, um, formed the, the Ecole de Psychiatrie d'Alger um, that Femme and, 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 and writes about. Um, and so um, they're, they're, they're calling these people Debi Nostalgie. They can have suffer from nostalgia, and I didn't really mention this, but this is an important sort of switch in 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 the in the sort of switch um, to a, a benign form of nostalgia. There is this moment around the turn of the, the mid 19th century when um, hardened racial scientific theory, of racial degeneration, and, and, and sort of racial determinism join forces in funny kinds of ways with with a, a renewed interest for environmental um, determinism and seasoning theories and activitization. And what it, this produces is this funny situation um, whereby all of a sudden um, um, creolization becomes problematic. Um, and so sort of adaptation to the local environment for, for colonial um, troops and settlers becomes problematic. And so actually what we want is our soldiers to keep longing for home, keep longing for France. Otherwise, they will become lotus eaters, right? And they will never return, they will never return home. And so that's the moment the switch when 
um, all of a sudden, um, from a, an instrumental political um, perspective, um, nostalgia becomes a, a moderate dose of nostalgia becomes something that might be denied, that might be more, that you might want to cultivate. You mentioned that in the early periods, nostalgia was associated with fatalities. Were you able to determine what modern medical diagnosis would be related to those fatalities? So in, in terms of what, would, what these people were dying in? Yeah, what were they dying of? Well, part of me wants to say no, but nostalgia, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> As a physician, I have a hard right. time with it. <laughs> what are the symptoms? <laughs> the, the symptoms are, they're all over the place. It's very difficult to sort of narrow them down. I mean, it, nostalgia really ends up being a sort of umbrella category for all sorts of things that come Some of them are remarkably similar to first diagnosis of shell shock, um, for example. I mean, the, the, the kind of um, the, the tremors, the, the aphonia, the, 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 the deliriums, the, 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 the nosebleeds, those, those kind of things. You, you, remarkably similar, and they, they really get on the cusp of wanting to describe this in the way we would recognize as a sort of form of, of psychic and trauma. They speak of the sort of um, frayed nerves of these soldiers, and they're, they're talking in this sort of vitalist um, way. Um, but so it's, 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 it's very difficult to say. There is, a, there is obviously it's a form of depression, obviously. Um, I would argue that it's also a form of, um, um, well, let's put it this way. Freud has a very interesting thing um, to say about um, war neuroses during the First World War, um, um, which is that the, um, he writes this in, in his comments on um, Otto Fer um, um, uh, uh, Ferenczi and um, the, 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 at the conference in 1968, and he, and he says um, what, um, what the war neuroses could only occur in an army, in a national army, what he means is in an, in an army of citizen soldiers, um, 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 because it is premised on the, the, the fact that the peacetime ego suddenly feels attacked by a wartime ego and is worried that a wartime ego will overrun the peacetime ego. That is not a trauma-based um, analysis. It's not, um, it's not the Freud that we, we often think of. It's, it's, it's actually an, a, an explanation that is much, more, much similar to, to the kind of explanation I have physicians describing um, what, saying literally, and I'm quoting, what kills the unfortunate nostalgic is the, the fear that um, he will no longer return to what he was. Um, um, and so, 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 so I, that's actually the connection that I found, found more, more in. And, and, and it's one that I think goes back to what I raised right at the end there, that um, there's a subterranean history, emotional history of, of war neuroses that trauma has sort of hidden to us, but that may reemerge. Was there a high incidence of suicides? Yeah, absolutely. Nostalgia was considered a prime cause of suicide. Okay, it's a question on the topic of suicide. It relates to the status of slavery in this project. So I'm intrigued about that for a couple of reasons. And the first being that, that, for example, these French missionaries who write about the be experienced by enslaved people in the Caribbean. You, you find that at the very beginning of the 18th century, if not in the 17th century, so you know, fully 100 years before. You know, the, I mean, of course, they're not using the term nostalgia, but they are talking about homesickness. But it is generally connected to suicide, and it seemed to be connected to suicide in the example that you showed. And I mean, one, one thing you could say about that is it's rather self serving you know, that their interpretation of the suicide of enslaved people is to miss Africa and they think that that would, you know, as opposed to an interpretation of the conditions of life, labor, domination. Mm -hmm. Yes, domination. absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I, I um, if I, if I read correctly what you're suggesting, um, I would absolutely endorse um, the idea that the nostalgia diagnosis in its various forms um, is also a way of minimizing um, um, of sort of, of carpeting, of sweeping under the carpet, um, the larger, larger problem um, of um, abstract domination, concrete domination um, in forms of labor. And that by saying that actually it just depends on sending the person home, and it's a way of sort of white washing. Um, is, is that, I'm not sure if that was looking at me, I'm not sure. 
what you're suggesting. But, um, yeah, but there's when, a connection there, I think. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and, and the one thing that um, um, I've encountered, I encountered a lot was um, the sort of the, 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 the horror and, and that you see a lot in the early 19th century abolitionist um, discourse um, and the practice of um, um, burying up to their torsos slaves that had committed suicide um, from plantation owners as a way of showing everybody else that the body does not return home um, if they commit suicide and it stays there in the plantations. Um, so I think there is a there are multiple levels of, sort of instrumental reading of this. Um, no doubt, yeah. And I wish I had explored this much, much further, obviously. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I love your book. It's a great book. Um, I have many, many questions, but I would just have one because we missed time. It's about gender, of course. <laughs> uh, you say in the one chapter that it's uh, a question of masculinity, that nostalgia is more and more uh, disease for men and less and less for women. And when I look at my letters uh, that were written at the beginning of the 19th century, I see that young women who are married are suffering from nostalgia and they want to go back home uh, as soon as they are married. They are uh, negotiating for coming home, uh, for coming back, and it's part of the marriage negotiation. And so uh, if you look at other documents, you can see that nostalgia is not just a question of being a man or a soldier. So I was wondering why or how you would link uh, nostalgia to men if you don't look at other documentation. <laughs> um, so I'll, uh, it's a, it's a half answer. The other half. What struck me was that initially nostalgia is not gender. It's, 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 for Hoffer, it's not a gender test. Um, it becomes so. Um, and it becomes so um, quite specifically, sort of irreversibly, quite specifically in the, in the 18, in post Napoleonic 1820s, um, which is precisely the moment, at least according to Foucault, um, when the, the, the invention of sexuality is as, as, as a scientific discourse, of course. And it's also the moment when hysteria becomes. And so one of the things that I, I say is that this, this simply a division of labor um, going on here between hysteria and, um, and, uh, and nostalgia. That, but that's a very superficial um, kind of um, um, partial um, um, answer. All I, all I can say is that um, I, as far as I'm concerned, um, nostalgia is a portmanteau for alienation. And the book was originally thought of as nostalgia, as alienation. And this is another answer to your question um, about why emotions, um, David. Um, if you read Marx's philosophical manuscripts, um, it's a theory of alienation as an emotional experience. Um, and that, for me, is something that is almost universal to the early stages of modernity, um, and still today in other, in other forms. And so it's, it's, it gets called nostalgia in certain environments um, where there is all sorts, where there are all sorts of logics, doctors, and, and reasons for, for, for doing so, instrumental reasons for calling it nostalgia rather than alienation. Um, and it just happens that in other places it's not. Um, and so then the, the problem becomes um, to sort of convey that I try to do inadequately, um, whilst also paying attention to the reasons why it's in certain areas, and eventually in a specifically male context that this gets, um, that, 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 that this particular term gets, gets affixed to whatever, whatever is actually going on. Um, but I'm perfectly um, inclined to believe that, that um, as many women could suffer from this as, as men. Um, so we'll have to, I'm, I'm, that's not a good answer. 